some nice calm Mozart uh, getting us into this segment of the program. Uh, that's because, of course, uh, Russell Singleton is a very calm physician assistant. Uh, I would say that most people in medical uh, fields generally do have a, a sort of a calm demeanor, a good bedside manner. Yeah, I would hope so, too, especially when <laughs> when uh, you, you get those little emergencies that always seem to walk through the door. Yeah, every day. <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> it's 8.34. And, of course, you're listening to Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We call this segment Better Health with Trip Family Medicine. And Russell or one of his counterparts or the doctor join us on Wednesday mornings between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And, of course, it's also an opportunity for you if you've got a question, medical question, to pose that won't cost you anything other than a phone call, and you'll perhaps get the right answer or you'll get directed toward the right answer. But today, uh, we're talking about the the technology revolution in medicine. And I started noticing this a few years ago when I was still living in Delaware. I would go to my doctor there, and he would walk in with a laptop, and he would simply plug it into a wall and pull up my entire med- medical history. And and then when I transferred to another office, same thing. And everybody is it, – it's so much – faster and the efficiencies of that so there's some good sides and some bad sides we'll be talking about today to all of this yeah we, we talked about electronic medical records or this uh, meaningful use law that was passed gosh probably i think it was 07 or maybe it was 09 but recently repealed uh, we kind of talked about how that the program was designed to help physicians implement more healthcare technology medical records specifically and we talked about the good and the bad but Today, I was going to focus on just the internet and how that is playing a role in healthcare, how that is changing the healthcare landscape, how the internet is changing the interaction between patient and and provider. So I hope to have a good discussion about that and maybe even hear from some callers, maybe some experiences about how the internet either led them to a diagnosis or maybe led them to a misdiagnosis, but, but that's where we're going today. I was going to say... You just brought up an interesting point. Uh, if a lot of people, if they think they've got something, they go and they look something up online. But you're going to find, though, if you do a search, and maybe most people are doing Google searches, I suppose they are, you're going to find hundreds and hundreds of different answers and sites. Now, some of those can be very reliable. The problem is knowing which ones are the good ones and which ones uh, might be giving you bad science. Absolutely. In preparation for today, I was I was on the Internet <laughs> looking up a couple of of journal articles and gathering some statistics like I usually do. And I found some interesting things that I'd like to share. First of all, uh, an article way back in 2003, okay, so more than a decade ago, reported that more than 80% of people were using the internet to obtain healthcare information. But another article, uh, this one's more recent, in 2012, talked about the validity of that information, something you just you just brought up. This actually comes from the Journal of Pediatrics as recent as 2012, but they wanted to actually put this theory to the test. So they they used Google and they they went out to find information on infant sleep safety. And in fact, I think those were the keywords that they used, infant sleep safety. They just typed it in and they were going to analyze everything they got for accuracy, for relevancy, and it was pretty surprising. (laughs) <laughs> what they found. In fact, when you come right down to it, less than half of all the information that they came up or, or that came up on, on Google was correct. Less than half. I think it was 43%. You've probably got parents. I mean, I'm, and I'm, I'll exaggerate this, but if, if they're recommending <clears throat> you give the child a shot of whiskey before bed, <laughs> you know, and they post that to the net, that's a, that's a remedy that may come up if you do a search like that. Well, absolutely. I think with the internet, the, the, the greatest feature, but also the worst, is the sheer quantity of information. You're going to find anything and everything. And sometimes when we go to the internet looking for answers, we take our our, our biases with us. If you're a strong proponent of alcohol and you start reading things about how giving your kid a shot of whiskey before bed will help them sleep, you're going to f- consider that validation. And that's a problem. But in that same study, it was also interesting to, to, to talk about what happened or, or, or what the case was with that other 60% of, of, of information. Because only about 40% of it was accurate and, and, and usable. So what about the other 60%? Well, roughly 30% of it was just flat out wrong. 
inaccurate, much like giving your kid a shot of whiskey before bed. Don't do that, please. The other 30% was completely irrelevant. And I don't know exactly what they meant by that, but I can get a sense of, of, of how that happens. When you type something in Google and right at the top of the page, you see something like two or three million results within you know 6.2 seconds or something. How much of that information is really targeted towards what you wanted to know? So less than half of it was accurate, a third of it was completely wrong, and another third of it was just completely irrelevant. That's what we're getting into today. That's that's one of the main issues with using the internet for 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 healthcare information. We've got more coming up with uh, Russell Singleton. He is a physician assistant at Trip Family Medicine. We should point out. Uh, the office is located on Fillmore Street here in, in the city in Twin Falls, directly across from the main post office. He'll have more of the contact information in just a few minutes as well. And uh, just a reminder, if you're inclined to give us a telephone call and perhaps you've had an Internet experience, good or bad, the number is 736-0300. That's 736-0300. We've got more ahead straight away. Ah, the theme from The Natural. Uh, it's baseball season, almost, so I guess we can do that. I actually uh, used to go to the stadium where that movie was filmed when I was uh, a young fellow, long, long ago before the broadcast career and the, some of those decisions in life. Speaking of careers, a medical career is one of the fastest-growing places in the country for people if you're looking for a job. I used to have a labor uh, a department fellow tell me that. Uh, he used to say, if you're going into medical careers, uh, you're likely going to have some job security. Well, I don't mean to toot my own horn here, but but the physician assistant profession, I think, is actually the fastest growing or has been in in, in many different surveys, or it's oftentimes deemed one of the best jobs in healthcare. And, and I have to agree. I love being a PA. I'm, I'm really grateful to folks like the Trips. They're a great family to work with. And I think we have a great clinic. We have a great crew. But yeah, you're right. Healthcare is a, a wonderful profession. And and. Hopefully it's getting better. Hopefully we're all getting smarter and partially because of the internet, because of all this information that we now have at our fingertips. I mean, I remember being a kid and I, you know, I'm not that old, but I remember dial up internet and I remember AOL and there just wasn't much to, to, to see out there. But now I don't go anywhere without my smartphone. I'm constantly, constantly looking at articles, peer reviewed references. I, I, I feel like I've got most anything I want at my fingertips, and I, I feel like and I hope that I'm a better practitioner because of that. We do want to mention uh, Russell Singleton is joining us in studio this morning from Trip Family Medicine. It's 844-28 right now, and if you've got a comment or question for the physician assistant while he's in the studio with us, the number seven three six zero three hundred. Bill Colley answering the telephones here on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And, and we talked a little bit about some of the, the, the downfall of all of this is that you've got to sort through right and wrong. But there are some tremendous benefits, obviously, if you know what you're looking for, especially uh, as a patient, uh, some tremendous benefits. And number two, I would think in your own office, as you just mentioned, you can pull a peer-reviewed paper up in a matter of seconds, which in the past you would have had to go looking for that somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I don't want um, our listeners to think that we're, not, that we're not fans of the Internet or that we think patients shouldn't be researching their health on the internet, because I, I I I think they should. I I need patients to be engaged. I need them to be educated. It's so much easier to help them make good decisions if they have a foundation, if they have a background. I think the issue becomes when they start pulling some of this information that is irrelevant, and when they come with these preconceived notions of what needs to happen because of what they read on the internet because they read on a blog or a message board that such and such a medicine or a, or a test worked for for so and so that that is what we need to do and that's difficult it's difficult to try and convince somebody otherwise i i, I think at trip valley medicine we pride ourselves on on being good listeners we're not perfect i know i need it's something i'm continually working on but just in the last couple of days, I've had a couple of good examples of this. I don't know if you've heard of this bill, but there's been some recent headlines about PPIs, things like Prilosec or Omeprazole that people take for stomach acid. I don't know if you've seen anything in the headlines, but 
there are some articles out there saying that these medications can contribute to and possibly lead to chronic kidney disease. So I've, I, I've had a couple of patients come to me and say, what do you think about this? Is this true? What do I need to do about this? And, and I think that's the perfect scenario. I have educated, well-meaning patients who still respect the relationship and, and, and want an opinion because they don't consider themselves experts and they're, they're, they're trying to gather that information so they can make a better decision. And, and, and I'm grateful that they include my opinion um, in, their, in, their, in their process. But in, in this particular case, we decided, at least with one patient, that yeah, she was better off probably stopping it. Mm -hmm. and, and that there were other ways to treat her, her reflux. And I, I, I guess there's two other examples too recently. There's some diabetes medications too, specifically, that have had some, I, I don't know if you want to call them bad headlines or, or bad press, but we use an injectable medication. Um, it's in a class of medications called the GLP-1s. It helps control blood sugars, helps the pancreas uh, secrete insulin a little bit better. Well, there's some research saying that that might hasten the demise or the, the burnout of the pancreas. So I've had some really good conversations with patients about why or why not I think that's true, why or why not I think that's relevant to them. And, and I really appreciate those patients. They're not demanding that, I can't believe you put me on this. You know, NPR said that I should be off of this or whoever. This is outrageous. But they say, hey, I read this. What do you think about this? Is this relevant to me? That is the best outcome. That is the best way to do it. And I'm, I'm really glad that, that, I, that I had those experiences recently. We're getting more and more of that bombardment, though, and it comes from television with people always trying to sell us a medicine. You know, ask your doctor about it, and your doctor yeah. may not think it's the best idea, but you get even more of that on the Internet. Oh, absolutely. What's scary, though, is in this uh, 2012 article from the Journal of Pediatrics, it, it was, uh, I, I, I guess, proven or shown that over 70% of adults who use the Internet for their healthcare information will be believe, quote, most or all of what they read. 70% will believe most or all of whatever is on the internet. And, and we've just proven that sometimes 60% of what you get is just worthless. It's completely inaccurate or it's totally irrelevant. It's also interesting to note where this information is coming from. You talked about kind of applying a filter, sifting the, the good from the bad. In order of, of uh, prevalence, when you get on Google and you, you type something in the search box, this particular study found that the most prevalent result were from companies or, or from research groups. After that were product review sites like Amazon, or I don't know if you include Yelp or, or you know, Epinion, stuff like that. And then third were educational sites in, in order of prevalence. But when they looked at accuracy too, the number one most accurate site or type of site were government sites, which is interesting. But you want to guess at, at the accuracy rating that those government sites got? Not 100%, not 90 it was 80 80%. The most accurate group of, of websites that you can find on the internet are government sites, according to this study, with a rating of 80% accuracy that's not as good as, as it should be, right? And The weatherman's and, even better than that. <laughs> probably. And if 70% of people are going to believe most or all that they read, then we, we, we've got um, an, a crisis on our hands. We've got an, an information overload that we need to try and sift through. And likely won't get any better as far as the volume. So we, we just need some uh, a, a, a governor on ourselves to understand what is the good site versus what is the bad site? And and I don't know that there's even a rating system available for that, or is there? I think there is. I can't recall the name of this group. And, and even if I could, I don't know what their metrics are or how they validate these different sites. I think that governor should be your healthcare provider. I think anything you read online should be filtered through your healthcare provider. And if you don't like your healthcare provider, if you if you don't trust him, well then get a new one. Get 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 someone that you do trust, someone who who has seen you and your family for years. That's the kind of relationship we're trying to develop at Trip Family Medicine. One doctor for the entire family. We want to see you, your kids, your parents, your grandparents, and we want to take care of pretty much everything. And we want to go the distance with you. And 
hopefully that will build relationships of trust and you can get to know us we can get to know you and you can rely on 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 our opinions but i i i do encourage patients to 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 be knowledgeable to research but i i ask that you give me a chance to weigh in on whatever you find it's 852 and russell singleton physician assistant from trip family medicine here in twin falls joining us on air it's 28 on our way perhaps to 50 today uh, for people who'd like to actually find Trip Family Medicine, we mentioned Fillmore Street, but you're also online as well. Yeah, we're talking about the internet today. So come visit us at tripfamilymedicine.com, T-R-I-P-P, tripfamilymedicine.com. We are piloting a new um, uh, internet feature, I guess. We, we have a portal that we've had for some time. It allows patients to log on to see their information, their, their labs, their medications. Oftentimes they can request refills through that portal. But the new feature that we've recently opened up is is the ability for patients to direct message your provider, almost like an email, but it is secure and it becomes part of your medical record. I, I've had a, an, an opportunity to, to test this with a couple of patients and it is pretty slick. It cuts down on, on red tape. As wonderful as our nursing staff is, I think they're they're, they're busy enough. They're overburdened. They don't need to be filtering messages from patients and then relaying them back to us. And because we don't have time to always call the patient back, we send the response back through the nursing staff. We can communicate directly online. And uh, I encourage you to, to check that out, tripfamilymedicine.com. There's a link called uh, Your Health. And all you have to do is take a look. Sometimes you're going to find people and they'll see something, I'm sure, online. And and, and so many people think that that's the authority. I remember dealing with my mother years ago when I would come home to visit, and she would tell me about something, and there was something she heard among her coffee group in the morning. They would gather at the coffee shop and have a conversation, and if she heard it from one of her friends, it was true, and you couldn't disabuse her of that. Sometimes it was a story that I'd been covering for weeks myself, and she would tell me that I was wrong, even though I had been an eyewitness to the event. You probably get some people who come in like that and you say, you know, what you were reading online is wrong. And they're like, well, I'm sorry, but I read it there. Yeah, absolutely. The, the Internet is pioneering the deprofessionalization of medicine. It is shifting the balance of power. Absolutely. And, and I think in a lot of ways, that's good. I think patients need to be in charge. I think they need to call the shots. I think they need to make decisions, hopefully with good information provided by their healthcare provider, among other sources. But the, the, the word of caution I would give is that most of what they're seeing in that case is anecdotal. And, and I don't think people realize, people who aren't trained in critical thinking, in evidence-based medicine, they don't realize how many variables are at play. For example, you know, let's just say you're talking to your friends, your coffee group about back pain. Well, Someone might complain of back pain because they have a herniated disc, and all of a sudden you, you start thinking, well, their symptoms sound like mine. I, I must have a herniated disc too, right? So, so a patient might come in demanding an MRI, which is incredibly expensive, or x-rays, you know, the day they start having pain, which I think is, is overuse. But they're not accounting for the fact that maybe this other individual is, a, you know, a general laborer that they have a family history. They might, might not consider that they're overweight, that the friend is overweight, that they're not. They, there, there could be other genetic factors. There could be medications. There could be other comorbidities that, that they're just not taking into consideration. And so it, it's really hard to just take someone else's experience and apply it to yourself, and, and let alone generalize it to, to other people. No one is argumentative, though. I mean, you, you're able generally to, to say to people, look, you know, I have the actual information here, and I wouldn't trust this site. Most people are willingly uh, that they'll go along with the you know your recommendation at that point. I, yeah, I would say most. <laughs> I I, w I would not say all. We we do get some patients that, that for whatever reason are argumentative, and I, I I hope it's not because they feel like we're not listening or we're not crediting the work they've done or their opinion, but. A lot of times these decisions are, are more emotional, I think. And then there's this confirmation bias where you go out on the internet, you can find anything you want, you, but you find something that confirms your fear of vaccinations, let's just use it as an example. And it, it, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what statistics I show. 
that that fear, that that emotion coupled with what they've read on the internet is is just insurmountable. And and I think most of the time though, even with those patients, we're able to still have a, a collegial relationship, a productive relationship. We just have to disagree on some things. Only when a patient really starts doing things or asking for things that I think are going to be detrimental to their health that are going to be dangerous to them or present a risk to us, maybe in a, you know, in, in, in a legal fashion, do we consider parting ways? But again, I'll just say it's important that you trust your provider. And, and I, I hope that you give that relationship time. I think that in this country, uh, the medicine uh, Institute of uh, institution of medicine is likely still the most trusted, uh, People would trust their doctor more than they would just about any other profession, I, I would still believe. Yeah, and, and medicine in the past has been much more paternalistic than it is now. And, and so there is a, a, a shift, but I, I think you're probably right. And I, and I hope we're worthy of that trust. I want to thank Russell Singleton, physician assistant, for dropping by today from Trip Family Medicine. It's coming up on 8.59. 9 o'clock news is just ahead from Fox. And in the next hour on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com, a new survey out of Canada shows Canadians believe that global warming is not man-made. Details on that ahead.